Am I on? Not yet. I'll count it down. Five, four, three, go. Hi, this is Maury Greenberg. And I, I, am, I want to talk about my late father, the late, my late father, Bernie Green, who was a press agent of many stars and, uh, and friend, important people in uh, politics. Uh, by the way, a press agent, just for your information, is somebody who gets the name of their client in the paper or sometimes keeps their name out of the paper in certain cases and it doesn't get any credit, but their idea, they get credit when their star is in the columns. And he was what, I, what they call a newspaper press agent, which probably doesn't exist much more today because newspapers are sort of not being used that much and not being read that much. He was raised in Brooklyn and, and he was raised in poverty. He used to come home uh, from from school and he would find their furniture out on that in the, uh, on the uh, street. And he said, oh, people would have, they would live on the street too many times because they couldn't pay the rent. He was interested in show business and since he was six years old and when he was six years old. And when he was 15, he tried to join a traveling show, but his mother wouldn't sign. So he always held that against her because she felt that she was keeping him out of performing in show business. Later on, he was, uh, he um, used to be interested in sending items to different newspaper men, including the late Walter Winchell, who was the most powerful columnist in, in in his time. Um, Walter Winchell was a com combination of uh, Walter Cronkite and Rush Limbaugh. And presidents would fear doing anything without clearing it with Winchell, especially Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. My father decided one day to send him a parody of the uh, song, You're the Top. And uh, Walter uh, printed it and my father then went around to different press agents and said, hey, look, I can get into Winchell's column. And uh, he was hired to do press agency from that. But uh, let me tell you, Winchell was a tough guy and there's a movie, The Late, The, the Sweet Smell of Success, which, um, which tells about Walter Winchell and the press agent industry. If you ever have a chance, it's a black and white film starring Tony Curtis and, uh, and uh, you might enjoy it. And, um, among his many clients was um, Bing Crosby. Uh, Bing, he had Bing for uh, 38 years as a client. And he said Bing was a, um, in certain ways, a tough client, in certain ways, an easy client. He never really bothered him, but he wasn't, he just felt very afraid of being in his, around Bing. He was a difficult person to be in personally. He had two families, um, with uh, two special families. He was married to Dixie Lee, and then also he was married to uh, Catherine Crosby, Catherine Grant. And he had two separate families. The first families was with the um, was with the boys, Gary, and he had four sons, and they did an act. And the other family had three children, including Mary Crosby, who shot Jr. The um, the first family was treated much poorer than the first family, than the second family. He gave the boys a hard time. And then there was a time, my father, we used to have a bungalow colony in the Laurels Country Club in the Catskills. And the boys were appearing at the um, Concord Hotel. And Bing calls up my father and said, I want you to get over there and see how they're doing and if they're not fooling around too much. 
So we had to drive over to the Concord and waited down in the lobby and called down Gary and Lindsay and the other boys who were doing the act. And my father said, oh, I just wanted to just happen to be passing by. And uh, I want to see how to just say hello. And he, he, my father would not tell him that Bing had called up and said to check up on him because he felt it was embarrassing. He also got a call from Catherine Crosby, um, who uh, called, who didn't like the guy, the, the boyfriend of uh, Mary Crosby, and he asked my father, who had a little bit of a relationship with her, to call up and try to interfere with the marriage and, you know, and possible marriage and say that maybe it wasn't a good idea for her to go out with, and my father refused. He said, I can't get involved in family affairs and uh, and he um, he just didn't get involved. And uh, I don't know if it made Catherine upset, but he didn't. There was a time when my father had somehow had a lot of confidence in himself. Bing had come here to perform at the Eurus Theater. And after the first week, after the first few days, it was not doing well. And Bing said to my father, I'm going to quit the show. I'm not going to do the second week. And my father said, if you do that, I'll quit. That might be a press agent. And it took a lot of courage because that was his biggest account. And uh, he eventually uh, said, I'll, Bing said, OK, if you can promise me that you'll fill up the place, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stay. And my father went on now, went on a publicity campaign, which I've never seen. He had him on every show, every newspaper column. He had him on the Joe Franklin show. He had him on the William B. Williams show. He had him on, on the Jack O'Brien show. And he had him on every show. And then it's Good Morning America. He had him sing White Christmas at the New York City Christmas lighting. And the, and the, and the uh, theater sold out, and my father felt vindicated, and so it being thanked him. I have a picture which I'm not sure how to show, but it said, thanks, Bernie, for everything that you did for us. Another one of his friends was Harold Alwyn, who, who um, he wasn't his client, but he was a close friend of his. And... Um, Harold wrote a lot of songs, including Over the Rainbow and Accentuate the Positive and Stormy Weather and hundreds of other songs. And I was in the seventh grade and uh, the, uh, we had to learn that song. And I said to, I came home to my father one day and I said, uh, that's a stupid song. Why do I have to learn a stupid song like Accentuate the Positive? I don't even understand it. So one day, one, one Saturday morning, my father said, there's a phone call for you. I said, who is it? I'm about 11 years old. I think I had to learn it in seventh grade. And he said, it's somebody for you. And it was Harold All. And he said, I heard you didn't like my song. And he uh, played the song, uh, he sang the song to me, and he said, now I hope you like it. <laughs> you know, it's tough when you're not talking to anybody and you're not getting any reaction, so I don't know if these things are going over or not going over. Uh, another one of his clients and friends was Henny Youngman. Henny was uh, a, a person who was known as this king of the one-liners, and my father used to write jokes for him. I'll just tell you a couple of them. Um, he said, the, uh, the secret to a happy marriage is to go out to romantic dinners twice a week. My, he, my, I'd say my mother goes out Monday, Tuesdays, and my father goes out Thursdays. I probably goofed the joke up. And the other one is about a boy in the New York City transit system um, in the New York transit system, if you're under six years old, you go on the bus for free. And this little boy gets on the bus and he, the bus driver asked him how old he is. He said, I'm 
five and a half. He said, when are you going to be sick? He said, when I get off the bus. I don't hear any laughing, so I don't know if it's going. Uh -huh. Ha, ha, ha. Another time he used to, my father handled, um, I perform a name, Jimmy Davis, and we talk about politics and and show business. My father, his, he used to sing "You Are My Sunshine," and his career wasn't going good. So my father came up with the gimmick of that he should run for governor of Louisiana as a publicity stunt, and. Uh, He actually won. And we were looking on the uh, internet the other day about Jimmy Davis. And uh, I'm ashamed to say that he was a segregationist, which I, my father never told me. I never knew that. But uh, he was the first person. I mean, my father might have been the first person who combined politics and show business, like Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump was also basically from show business. Um, he also uh, handled movie um, uh, clients. He had Warner Brothers, and uh, there was a time when Jack Warner called up my father. He never heard from Jack Warner. He handled Warner Brothers, and he um, he said, "Bernie, I." I I don't know if he called him Bernie or what he said. Basically, what he said is that Virginia Woolf is not doing good. Come up with something. And, and my father was a pretty good on his feet. He came up with this brilliant idea. He got a sheriff in Texas to, to close the movie. They went to some small town in Texas. He had to fly in and show you how corrupt people are. The guy wanted $10,000 in singles for him to shut down the movie. So it was, uh, so they would, they, they put the movie into Texas and I don't know, this is back in probably the 50s or 60s, I don't know when the movie was. You couldn't do that today. Imagine going on a plane with $10,000 in singles and they put the movie in the theater and, and they had a big publicity stunt where the, uh, where the sheriff came down, he said, I can't have a smut film like this in my, in my, uh, in my town. And he closed it down. And they got the next day, he couldn't get into the movie. And the reason Jack Warner was so upset about the, um, about the movies, he was paying Richard Burton and Elizabeth Martin Taylor a lot of money. And it was a big hit on the studio off the movie, didn't do well. And that's, my father was, quick on his feet and he was able to do it. Uh, any more audience reaction? I don't know. I'm seeing some uh, reaction on YouTube chat. Are they saying something? Yeah, <laughs> you have funny stuff. My, um, my father also handled the Nelson family, Ricky Nelson, Nazi Nelson, and I've Harriet Nelson. It was the adventures of Harry. Ozzy and Harriet, now there wasn't much adventure in those days. I mean, the adventure was Ozzy never worked and stayed home, but I don't know, the show was on for 10 years. And one, one um, my father was a uh, partner with Maury Fowler, who I'm named after. And Maury used to be his, his traveling manager as well as his press agent. And one, for some reason, Maury couldn't make it. And my father went to Japan with Ricky, and uh, it was a great experience. And I met Ricky in Freedom Land, um, which was a where a co-op city is now in New York City. By the way, uh, if anyone, I just look into my face in the mirror. When I don't be scared, I haven't had a shave in three months, <laughs> and I haven't had a haircut in three months since we've been shut it down here because of this virus that just never goes away. Uh, anyway, he went to Japan with him and, and I, when I met him in, in Freedom Land, he couldn't have been nicer with you. I know Ricky eventually died in a plane crash, but my father wasn't handling him then. 
he was, my father had passed away in 1983. And he was so polite, Ricky Call kept saying, Mr. Green, Mr. Green. He never would, um, um, he would he never call him Bernie, but imagine he's a client, he's calling him Mr. Green. That's the way he was raised by Ozzie Nelson, who was a band leader, my hearing back knocking who was a band leader from uh, New Jersey and he formed, uh, we married Harriet Hilliard, who was the band singer. Another one of his clients was uh, Danny Thomas. And Danny was um, one of my uh, favorite people. What is that noise? Someone wants to come in. Somebody wants to come in the house? Yeah, but they have to wait till after the thing. Well, go see who it is. I will. <laughs> you know, it's it's unusual. We're doing this in my in in our uh, guest room, and it uh, and it uh, it's strange that performing in front of an audience. I've done this before in front of audiences. And... We've got eleven people already, Roy. Who was on the phone? Who was there? Roy, keep on talking. Um, no one's here. Another one of his clients was uh, Bert Backer. And Bert was, uh, he got this account because his, uh, his, um, his, he was friends with the columnist Bert Backer. Now in the Jewish religion, you're not supposed to name a son, another son, a child after the father, but the way they did it is Bert Backrack, the columnist spelled his name B-E-R-T, and Bert Backrack, the songwriter was B-U-R-T. And I remember when, a couple of stories about Bert, um, when my father was uh, very sick, he had throat cancer and he couldn't talk. Bert called him a few times just to say hello. You know, he couldn't talk to him, but he just wanted to say hello and, uh, and just give him, uh, you know, a little bit of hope that maybe he would survive. And Fred was very supportive, and and he paid my father uh, throughout the years he was sick, even though my father really wasn't producing for him. He also called this. He he was in a slump, um, and. Uh, he was. He wrote the song for Arthur's song, and he uh, he wrote. They won the um, Academy Award, and uh, I guess Bert didn't remember the time difference, but it was uh, three o'clock in the morning in New York when he called him at midnight to say we won. He woke us up, and uh, he was. Uh, I think Bert's still alive, and uh, I wish I could say hello to him again, but I. Obviously, I'm not in the business anymore. Uh, another one of his college clients, and you, some of you might not know Danny Thomas. I know because the name, you know, as a generation's fade, Danny Thomas was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. He had a comedy show, the uh, Danny Make Room for Daddy. And uh, he uh, also he was the producer of the Andy Griffith Show, The Real McCoys, and The Dick Van Dyke Show. And uh, he uh, was very nice to me um, and my brother. When every time we met him, he would give us a hundred dollar bills. <laughs> My father tried to probably arrange for us to meet him numerous times, but uh, he was very generous. And now I don't know if you know, his, his, his daughter is Marlo Thomas and Danny had found uh, St. Jude's Hospital, um, which uh, is helping kids for free who have cancer. And uh, Danny was one of the nicest people I ever met. I don't know if, I don't know any, I don't know him that well, but my father told me he was really nice to everybody. Uh, 
I'm going to tell you another story about my uh, my father knew Nat Hyken, who wrote the the Bill Gold Show. I don't know if you remember that show with Ernie with uh, Phil Silvers, that you never get rich. And uh, I used to be afraid of dogs. And my father would sit at the table at Lindy's. Uh, they used to, every day they would have a big table of celebrities and uh, they would sit there and they would all talk and it was a crazy table. They were all celebrities or songwriters or producers. And that's by the way he got the Bing Crosby account. He met at one of the producers uh, of the show there and uh, they got friendly and I forget the guy's name now. Um, and, he get, and he recommended that my father get the accounts of Bing. Anyway, um, Nat Hyken said they needed a, so anyway, I was, uh, when I was growing up, I was bit by a dog when I was uh, four years old. I had to get rabies shot, so I was afraid of the dog. And my father thought it would be a great idea to uh, to get me a dog, so I would start lugging dogs. And um, so they got me that Rocky Graziano's pup had some uh, dog had some uh, puppies, and they got me this dog, and they called it Rocky. And Rocky was. Uh, was um, a full of French poodle, which I got to like it. Unfortunately, I didn't, uh, I was still, I like Rocky, but I was still afraid of other dogs. But anyway, Bill Cole said, uh, Nat Hyken said they need a dog for a show with Doberman. I think it was in 1958. So my father said, here, you can have Rocky. So my dog Rocky was on the Bill Cole show with Doberman, I don't know the whole problem plot, but I remember my father said the dog's going to be on, uh, on, uh, going to be on television. Any questions? I don't hear any. Oh, that was a good question. Hey, Maury. Yes. When you finish talking about the stars that you're talking about, I do have a couple of questions. You do? What are your questions? I'm just talking. And I'll ask I'm not finished yet. Anyway. I'll be finished soon. I'm sure everybody's walking out by now. Boy, stop it. My father used to handle a lot of restaurants, especially Corvadas. And I'll tell you the little trick that he used to, and he met a lot of uh, politicians there, and all of them wanted to. He used to meet Happy Rockefeller, Jacqueline Onassis. He got to know. Um, Robert Wagner, the mayor, and they got very close friendly with him. And they all wanted to be in the paper, so they would give him items. They said, this one said this at Corvallis, and that one said this at Corvallis. And he had a, a, a gimmick with Richard Corkery in the, uh, of the Daily News. He was a, a chief photographer. And the deal was, if they, got a, they took a picture, if the picture got in the paper, he had a free meal at Corvallis with his wife. So he had his beeper number, and every time a celebrity came in, he he uh, he phone uh, Richard Corkery, and they'd be outside as the as the celebrity came out, so they could take the picture. My father knew uh, knew a lot of politicians, and I I met the Kennedy, I met John Kennedy when he was a senator in Matt from Massachusetts in 1957. And my father said he, and he signed a picture for us, which we have here in the house. I've lost some of the pictures, by the way. I don't know where they've disappeared since when he moved. And uh, I shook his hand, and I didn't know he was going to be the president, but I was only 10 years old, so he probably I couldn't vote for him anyway. Uh, this, this was an interesting life living with my father. Uh, I didn't realize that growing up that he was famous and all I know is every night he, he was very nervous and he would go out for the uh, 
bulldog edition of the news every night and see if his name was in the paper or if the if columns, they had different columns like Ed Sullivan and uh, Bob Sylvester and uh, Charlie McCary, I remember was another columnist. And he knew all these columnists and he wanted, and he used to go get the news because they came out first to see if there's papers in there. And speaking of Ed Sullivan, my father, Ed Sullivan was married to a Jewish girl named Sylvia, I believe. And uh, Ed, Ed's wife died and he called my father to uh, see if he can help him arrange the funeral and a Jewish funeral so his wife would be buried as a Jew properly. And uh, he was very close with Ed. A matter of fact, I'll tell you a story. Every every Sunday, Ed lived in the Monica Hotel, and uh, every uh, every Sunday morning, he would drive into the city. My father never stopped working. He worked seven days a week, and he would. Uh, Park the car, and I'd have to run into the car to the hotel as he double parked, so that we could give, leave the copy at the front desk, so that it would be in the paper. And he would used to say, "Ed, I need this. I need that. I need this." And Ed would very often put the item in. I'm I'm just thinking of anything else I can talk about. I have some ideas. Go ahead. What do you have, hon? And the oh yeah, he used to handle the African rooms, which was a nightclub, and it was an uh, they had African entertainers and Richie Havens and Johnny Barracuda were the main participants, and uh, and uh, by the way, talking about Green, my father's real name was Greenberg, of course, but. He changed it to Green for show business purposes, and the owner of the club was uh, Joe Green. So one of the columnists said to my father, I guess you must be your relative. He said, no, his name is Ginzer and mine is Greenberg. So they both had the same green, green but they weren't, uh, they weren't together. My, my father's also very friendly with Barry Goldwater. Now, he didn't necessarily agree with him politically, but they used to exchange stories about their mothers. And my father felt that he was an honest man and whether you agree with him or not, at least he told you what he thought. Um, somebody banging on the door again? No. I guess it's all the crowd I'm keeping out here. Talk about um, the father and Gertrude Berg. Uh, oh yeah, my father used to, my used to, you know, it's very funny. My, my wife is reminding me because she knows more about my father than I do, I think sometimes. Uh, my father used to write for the, used to handle a program called the Goldbergs. And Molly Goldberg was the, um, was the uh, star of the show. And my father's mother used to say things that my father would put in the show. And she used to say, my father would criticize her and say, two wrongs don't make two rights. And my father's, my, and then they were listening to the show and she said, you see, Mr. Big Shot, Ms. Molly Goldberg said the same thing that I say. So it's just funny, you know, a lot of times the best humor is, uh, is, is what a real life humor. And I remember he wrote a show for uh, Beaver, Leave it to Beaver. He wrote a show on that. And uh, because I didn't like Brussels sprouts and my father wrote the show for it. And I was watching the show and he didn't tell me he had written this show for them. And uh, he, uh, the show was about even not liking Brussels sprouts. And it's, it's funny how real life comedy becomes, uh, goes into the show. The, the funniest shows are, show, are comedy that happens. I think I've- uh, uh, Talk about some of the songwriters. 
Oh yeah, he knew my my wife is a Miami. He knew songwriters. He used to. He knew uh, Johnny Marks, who was the um, who wrote Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. He knew yeah. Joe Meyer, who wrote California Here I Come. And. Uh, Hold on, there's a delay. No, there's no delay. I'm waiting for some more jokes. Yeah, he knew Irving Caesar and Seaford too, and he knew all the songwriters. I think the man could have written a song by now. I did talk about the Lindy. The Lindy's table was a table that um, was a very big thing in Lindy's thing. And I, you had to be a celebrity to sit there. I mentioned that uh, the people that said, Bill, and by the way, it was Bill Morrow who got from Ben Crosby to reach out. Uh, and I remember one day, um, my father brought me to the table reluctantly. And uh, Jack Leonard, who was a columnist, who was the comedian, Fat Jack Leonard, said to me, don't worry, don't order too much. You don't want to break Bernie's budget. And um, they, um, they, there was a very crazy table. They had their own special rules. And uh, I remember a story he did tell me about the table uh, that he pulled on the, there was a famous maitre d' at the table, uh, High Heller. And Hello was was well known, and but I'm sure nobody knows him now. And uh, my father ordered a corned beef sandwich at Lindy's, and he complained about the um, about that the sandwich didn't have enough meat. And Hello said, "Well, that's the way the sandwich is." Uh, and um, about a week, two weeks go by, and my father, before he goes to Lindy's, goes into the stage deli. All these places are called the stage deli, the Carnegie deli. And he buys a half a pound of corned beef and puts it in his pocket. And uh, he goes into Lindy's and orders a, a corned beef sandwich, and he puts this extra meat on the uh, sandwich, and he calls Heller over. And he says, hey, Heller, I guess they got the message in the kitchen about the corned beef sandwich. And Heller goes into a rage. He thinks that they're bankrupting and putting this much meat on the sandwich. That, that was the kind of sense of humor my father had. He also did something I remember. There was a, a commercial with uh, 43 beans of coffee, beans of Nescafe coffee in every uh, cup of coffee. And my father counted out 42 beans. He bought coffee beans to put it in a cup. And he called Heller over and he said, there's only 42 beans of coffee in my cup. My, fa my father also wrote about the, My father also wrote for the Brooklyn Eagle um, just before he became a full-fledged press agent. He used to write a, movie, a column called Pen Portraits, which I don't know how he got the job, but I don't know. I certainly didn't take after him. He had the, uh, somehow seemed to have the ability of um, getting these jobs and he knew how to stand on his feet. No, no, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to talk about Jack Lemon, by the way, who was my father's favorite client, who used to do a lot of Warner Brothers movies. And he said that Jack Lemon was the easiest person to deal with. If, if he said, um, we need something at 730 in the morning, I need an interview with a columnist, he never would say, oh, I can't do that, Bernie, it's too difficult. He said, anything I could do to help the movie um, would be great. And uh, he, uh, 
he really um, he really felt very highly about the thing, about uh, about Jack Lemmon. I remember a story he told me about Fred Astaire when they were doing the they were doing the publicity for Finian's Rainbow, and he wanted to walk down Broadway intentionally with Fred. Hopefully somebody would recognize him, but nobody came by. He said he was a, he just felt it didn't work out for him. Another car, another client, by the way, my father first started. He worked for a guy named Jay Fagan. And his salary was nothing a, a week, and he didn't even have a desk. They said that it was the Jay said it was like a uh, a school, and uh, you're lucky you're not paying uh, tuition, so you're getting it for free. And my father would there would be no desks for him, so when somebody went to lunch or when somebody went to the bathroom, we had to sit at their desk. It was pretty funny. And he told me about Will Rogers, the great. Uh, the guy from Oklahoma, he was sort of like a folklore hero. And they were supposed to come out, they, Jay had this great idea of coming out with a, uh, a lasso, a Will Rogers lasso. But Will Rogers decided at the last minute to back out because he was afraid if a kid ever ch choked himself with the, with the uh, rope, he'd be responsible. So he refused to endorse the uh, the, uh, the last one. He also handled Louis Armstrong through Joe Glazer. Uh, Joe Glazer was, um, by the way, if I just touch my head, I'm still thinking. Um, Joe Glazer was the, was the uh, booking agent for all the stars. As a matter of fact, Joe Glazer used to give us ball game tickets to the Yankee game, he used to have box seats all over Yankee Stadium. And if he found out that you didn't root for the Yankees, he'd make sure you were kicked out of the box. He once kicked out my father's partner, Maury from Los Angeles because he was rooting for the Angels. And the thing with, um, with uh, Louis Armstrong, he said Louis Armstrong had like a thousand white handkerchiefs he didn't, and he just needs to sweat a lot. And he also said, Louis Armstrong could fall asleep in 10 minutes and wake up and like he was refreshed. He said it was the most amazing thing he ever saw. And Louis was always very nice to my father. I think that ends my uh, talk. Uh, I can't take any questions, unfortunately, because I can't hear you. I have a question for my wife. Go ahead. What's your question? I have a question here. Uh, if, anyone has a... if anyone has any questions, you can put it on YouTube comments. Put it on YouTube comments, and we can ask answer questions. Yeah. Um, oh. Watch, does anyone have a question? Yeah, I remember my, my wife reminds me of my father's. I don't know if anyone reminds, used to watch the, the quiz show, What's My Line with Dr. So Darcy Kilgallen with John Daly and Arlene Francis and Bennett Surf. And uh, my father used to hate Bennett Surf, by the way. He said if Bennett Surf was a, a humorist, then Willie Sutton was a banker. But uh, Darcy Kilgallen wrote columns. And my father used to uh, write a column uh, every year at the end year end column for him. She used to go on um, on these junkets with my father from Warner Brothers. And I remember forget my mother was so mad one time she told me, Dorothy Kilgallen, they were all on the same plane and 
Dorothy said to my mother, would you mind if Bernie, if I borrowed your husband for the entire flight? <laughs> and that's all they talked for five hours. And she was pretty upset that my mother had to sit alone without Dorothy Kilgallen. Talk about also Dr. Noah. I don't remember that one. No, I think that's a bad. Oh, one of his clients, I know you probably never heard of him, was a comic, Morty Gunty. And um, he used to open up for Stephen Eady. Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, I'm sure. And uh, he was a comedian. I know one of his favorite jokes was if um, the best way to make a roast beef is you buy a large roast beef and a small roast beef and you put them in the oven when the small roast beef burns, the other one's done. And he laughs. He laughs. David, Song? Yes, I did. Sorry. I did you tell her. I sang the song. Okay. Um, I'm hoping. Um, Some of the comments want to write a book about this. And, uh, I hope. I hope everyone um, had a good time. I. It's a little tough not talking in front of an audience and not getting reaction in front of you because it's just, you don't know how to- Oh, Dave wants to know why did you get involved in your father's business? Dave, I didn't get in my father's business because my father in 1970s, in the late 70s felt that the press, that the, he was gonna be the last um, Broadway press agent with newspapers and he felt it wasn't a good business anymore for me and he felt I, I did do a little bit of um, press agency but not much I when he was sick I used to send out copy for him but uh, I probably should have <laughs> retrospect because market research seems like it's on its last legs <laughs> I hope everyone enjoyed the little talk and uh, next time I hope I can talk in front of an audience because I'll be back by popular demand. I know they're gonna. Uh, Facebook Live. Maybe we'll try Facebook Live so I can see who I'm talking to. I wanna thank everyone for their time and uh, Ralph, you can shut the machine off because I'm Signing off. Thank you very much.